Hi everybody, it's Mr. Robbins back again to start our discussion for the Unit 4. Um, so Unit 4 is the biggest unit we've had yet. Um, and so we're starting in 1800 with the election of Thomas Jefferson and talking about his presidency. And today we will talk about uh, the presidency of his successor, James Madison. But by the time we're done with Unit 4, we will have gone forward uh, about 30 years in time and we'll have talked about uh, the presidency of the seventh president, uh, uh, Andrew Jackson. So a lot of stuff in this unit. So we'll continue kind of talking about presidents like we have done uh, at the end of unit three, but we're also going to start to kind of get more general and start talking about some big themes in the United States in the early 1800s that are going to be important for us as we move into unit five and, and then into unit six, which will be the Civil War unit, so we're getting closer and closer to that conflict. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, let's go ahead and get started uh, today with Jefferson. So by the end of this, uh, you'll be able to analyze challenges faced by the first five presidents, uh, and so in this, we're trying to talk about the third and fourth presidents, so Jefferson and Madison ex uh, explicitly. Uh, and so we will be talking about Jefferson's exp expansion of presidential power, including the purchase and exploration of Louisiana and the Louisiana Territory, the case Marbury v. Madison and its importance on judicial review, and then we'll talk a little bit about James Madison's presidency and the War of 1812, which will help to lead to the development of a national American identity of like what it means to be American. So we'll talk more about that shortly. Okay. So, as we move into 1800, we are moving into a period we're going to call the antebellum era, okay? Antebellum is a Latin term, okay? So, we're going back to old Roman uh, terminology here with, with our Latin, but really all it means is before war, okay? And obviously, based on the context, we're talking about before the Civil War, okay? Okay? Now, this whole period could be from 1800 to 1860, because we're going to see slowly but surely, we're going to keep building and building towards this conflict of the Civil War that all of us knew was coming before this class even started, okay? But for this unit, Unit 4, we're really going to be talking about this so-called early uh, antebellum, okay? So this is the zone we're going to be in for unit four. Unit five is going to be more of this stuff um, in, the, uh, in the 1840s to the 1860s, so we're not going to get there yet. And then as far as this video, we're really only going to be talking about this period here, the first uh, 15 or 16 years or so uh, of this early antebellum era. Now, to pick up where we left off, we talked about the Revolution of 1800. So in the election of 1800, uh, John Adams, the current incumbent sitting president, um, runs for re-election against his old rival, Thomas Jefferson. But in this, the Democratic Republican, Thomas Jefferson, wins, right? But this is really significant because it's the first time a new political party is taking control of the presidency. So Adams is a Federalist. Now the Democratic Republicans under Jefferson are taking control. But it's a peaceful transition. There is no battle. There is no fighting. There's no rebellion. And in fact, Jefferson famously says in his uh, inaugural speech, we are all Federalists. We are all Republicans. Kind of saying, listen, we're all in this together. We don't need to fight, even though we might have differences of opinion. Now, this is significant because it's going to be the first, uh, the first time that this party change has happened, but it's going to be the last time that the Democratic Republicans give up power for about the next 30 years. And so that really is only going to start to change as we get to the end of this unit. So this is very much a period of Democratic-Republican dominance in, public, uh, in uh, politics. Now, again, it is a close election, though, because... Adams still had his supporters, particularly places like New England had a lot of Federalist support and more rural areas of places like North Carolina and Pennsylvania still um, had some, or more urban areas of places like Pennsylvania and New, uh, North Carolina had a lot of federal support. 
the more rural areas of these states, uh, like Pennsylvania and North Carolina, generally were Democratic, Republican, and supporters of Jefferson. Now, Jefferson came into office, and now that he's, a, you know, coming into office, now he's going to be president, representing this Democratic-Republican Party, we probably should not be too surprised that his first kind of agenda items, his first things on the list to do as he comes into, the, uh, into office is to reverse a lot of Federalist policy, okay? Namely, we're talking about reducing the size of and the cost of the federal government, the national government, okay? Now, Jefferson will do this a few different ways. One, uh, and the most important way he lowers costs, is by reducing the size of the army. And so Jefferson actually more or less eliminates a standing army, okay? A standing army would be an army that's just hanging around, waiting to be used in potential wartime. Uh, in the modern day, all major countries have standing armies, even if they're not in active conflict. But in this period, a lot of times countries would send their soldiers home after a war or whatever to prevent them having to be paid because you have to pay soldiers if they're out there in uniform for you. And so Jefferson said, hey, we don't want to pay for that. We're not going to get into a war. So he, he does reduce the size of the army to a very, very small amount. He also begins taking shots at Hamilton's financial plan, like those excise taxes, like excise taxes being taxes on specific goods, like whiskey uh, that Hamilton set up while he was Secretary of Treasury. Uh, he, uh, Jefferson will end all of those taxes um, and he also takes uh, a shot at the Bank of the United States. Now, the way the Bank of the United States is set up under Hamilton's financial plan was that it had a charter. Now, what this charter meant is that it gave the bank a right to exist for a certain amount of time, okay? But it was only a brief amount of time, only 20 years after um, Hamilton proposed it. And so near the end of that 20 years, that is when Jefferson's in office as president, he will not re-sign the charter. So the Bank of the U.S. will go away and cease to exist, uh, which gives Jefferson a final victory over that uh, institution that he thought was not constitutional, and if not that, certainly not good for regular people. Okay. And speaking of regular people, do you want to talk a little bit about this? So, um, the uh, agrarian republic, okay, is what Jefferson looked at as the number one thing to protect liberty. So, agrarian would mean kind of agriculture based, okay. Uh, republic, uh, we're obviously talking here about a representative democracy, okay? So in Jefferson's eyes, the regular farmers, he called these yeoman farmers, Y-E-O-M-A-N, yeoman farmers, uh, they would do their job, which was working the soil. They worked the land, make, uh, you know, whatever it was they were making. Usually what Jefferson thought of was like these guys who were making, you know, subsistence farms so that basically to... Uh, survive for themselves and their family, may sell a few goods on an open market, but mostly just out there surviving for themselves, okay? Uh, participating in politics through voting and getting representatives to kind of represent their interest, uh, and then that would be the best way to protect liberty, okay? Now, there is some irony behind this, okay? Number one is that Jefferson in no way was a small-time subsistence farmer, Instead, he was a big-time plantation owner. So he owned a huge, huge farm wherein he did not much of the actual labor because he was a slave owner and he owned slaves. Most of these people that Jefferson's thinking about, though, when he talks about an agrarian republic, are small-time farmers who are not going to own slaves. So there's kind of one thing that's a big separation there, right? And then we're going to see that while Jefferson might like this as like an ideal, like something he wants to strive for, it's going to be a lot harder to actually implement this in practice. So, 
Let's start talking about the things that actually went on in Jefferson's presidency. The first thing we want to talk about are the so-called midnight judges. Now, this is something that we got to take one step back on, and we need to talk about something Adams did as he was leaving office. Okay. Now, as he left office, Adams appointed a series of judges, uh, Federalist judges, to federal courts. Okay. Uh, one of which was the new chief justice, that lead justice on the Supreme Court, John Marshall. So John Marshall was a Federalist, a close ally of Adams, and he got appointed to be chief justice just in the last couple minutes of Adams' presidency, along with others. Now, this is going to mean long term, the Supreme Court uh, is going to take a pretty profound role in politics, where they really hadn't done so before, okay? Uh, and they're going to do so by really strengthening the power of the national government and itself, the itself the Supreme Court, okay? But it is political because Marshall is going to be doing this in the goal of kind of promoting a, a, a functioning national government, but especially at first, this is going to run into some roadblocks because of Jefferson and his viewpoint on not having a powerful national government. Now, over the course of his time in office, about 30 years as Chief Justice, which is a long time, John Marshall will have a series of cases that will, generally speaking, increase the power of the national government over uh, the states or protect citizens in individual states from their state governments and kind of assert their individual rights free of state control. Now, we're not going to talk at length about all of these. We're really just going to focus on today, the first one on this list, Marbury v. Madison. Uh, so I'll talk more about that later. But the other ones here, uh, McCullough v. Maryland dealt with uh, the power of the state of Maryland to um, tax a federal bank which was overturned, saying that Maryland could not tax a federal bank. Dartmouth College v. Woodward dealt with uh, a contract that the state, uh, that a state was trying to break with uh, a college, in this case Dartmouth College, uh, but uh, Marshall's court will affirm that contract to continue and bind and that the state could not just break it. Uh, Gibbons v. Ogden, deals with uh, interstate commerce okay, up in the Northeast and kind of what happens when two states are, are, are competing over uh, a shared waterway like the Hudson River in New York. Okay? The Cherokee Nation v. Georgia is one we'll talk more about at the end of this unit, but dealt with the state of Georgia trying to uh, take some action over Cherokee that were within their borders. We'll talk again more about that later. Um, in Unit 4, because a lot more to talk about with the Cherokee. Uh, but we're really going to hone in on this Marbury v. Madison here in a moment. But the big takeaway is, is that all of these cases, generally speaking, increase the power of the national government over the state governments. Now, the, this case, Marbury v. Madison, uh, comes out of the Midnight Judges. Now, Jefferson... First thing he comes into office is that he tells his Secretary of State, uh, James Madison, who we'll talk more about his presidency here in a moment, to invalidate as many of those midnight judges, okay? And essentially what they do is they just kind of have these commissions that, you know, the judges actually have to get to go get started on their job, and Madison just doesn't send them out, okay? He just holds on to them, all right? Now... This was problematic because Adams had signed these, okay? So in theory, even though they did it at the last minute, these judges are supposed to be appointed. And one of these judges, a guy named William Marbury, he decides, okay, I'm going to sue the, the government and try to get my job, okay? Now, Marbury would say, listen, this, uh, these, um, my job had been, I've been nominated by the, uh, by the president, it had gone through Congress, had been approved, so I should have my job, okay? And this case got to the Supreme Court. Now, there was just one problem, though. It was how the argument was actually set up, 
Okay. Now, in reality, when they heard the case, uh, Marshall agreed. Okay. Yes, Mr. Marbury, you probably should have your job, right? Uh, so someone ought to give you your job. Okay. So they agreed that all the rules were followed, even though Jefferson didn't like it. Okay. Next, they agreed that because something had been wrong, okay, that Marbury was due a remedy, that someone needed to fix this for him, okay? And, and if what he wanted was his job, he should be given the judgeship. But there was one problem. The thing is, is that the congressional law that Marbury was referencing said the Supreme Court was the one to give this remedy, to give him his job. But as Marshall was reading over the case and reading over the federal law, he realized that that was something that the Supreme Court under the Constitution couldn't actually do. So he said, Mr. Marbury, while we hear you and we want you to, you know, understand that we agree with you, we cannot give you your job because the law is unconstitutional. Now, the thing is, is that I don't want you to get so hung up on the story of Marbury, okay? Rather, that what's important from this is that Marshall and the Supreme Court are saying, hey, a law passed by Congress does not line up with the Constitution. And so, we ought to throw out at least that part of the law. That is what we call judicial review. The power of the Supreme Court, one of its most important powers today, is to review the constitutionality of laws. And if, a Supreme, if the Supreme Court decides that a law, whether it be a national, a federal, or a state law, is unconstitutional, then that law is just thrown out, okay? Because it does violate the Constitution. Now, uh, this does mean that the Supreme Court after Marbury v. Madison is really, really going to be focused on this idea. And this is really what the Supreme Court does today. Um, and it happens all the time. Most of the times we don't know it. The most recent one that uh, most folks may have heard of uh, was the case of Obergefell v. Hodges, which back in 2015 would uh, uh, invalidate state laws that made gay marriage illegal. So today in all 50 states, uh, LB, LGBT folks do have to be allowed to marry. That's probably the most recent uh, kind of big case of it, but it happens all the time on much, much smaller scales. Um, and that is a legacy of Marshall and his Supreme Court because this idea of judicial review, very importantly, is not actually explicitly in the Constitution it's just a right and a power that Marshall basically just says, listen, the Supreme Court should have this power, so it does. Now, moving on from court stuff to talk about population. Now, during Jefferson's time as president, we have a huge, huge growth in the population. From about 1800 to 1810, about 2 million uh, people growth, worth of growth of the population, Okay. A lot of this is natural growth, so this is not a ton of immigrants, but rather Americans having bigger and bigger families, the people growing up and having more and more families, and therefore, we're starting to see a large movement west into what today we would call the Midwest, places like Ohio, which becomes a state in 1803, Kentucky, which becomes a state in 1792, and Tennessee, which becomes a state in 1796. Now, in 1800, a guy called Napoleon uh, will have come to power in, in France uh, and is slowly but surely uh, taking over full control of France and kind of creating it into his empire that he'll be overseeing for the next 15 years or so. Now, uh, one of Napoleon's conquests was a conquest of Spain, he took over Spain. He actually put his brother in charge of Spain, uh, which didn't go too well, but we won't get so much into that. And so what's important to us is that part of that deal was that Louisiana, which had been lost to the French in the French and Indian War way back in the 1760s, is returned to the French from the Spanish, okay? 
Now, Napoleon took this over with the goal of kind of making a new colonial republic, a new colonial power out there in North America, kind of retake some power for the French. It did not quite work out that way, because in between 1800 and 1803, uh, a little rebellion in the French island of Saint-Domingue really heats up, and eventually the Republic of Haiti declares itself independent from France, and to try as he might, Napoleon is not able to defeat the, uh, the rebels there who are the uh, slaves who revolted and uh, got their own freedom in the first majorly successful slave revolt to make its own country um, in the Caribbean. Now, after Haiti's rebellion and the French's inability to kind of win that rebellion, uh, Napoleon kind of changes his mind. And he says, you know what? I don't care about colonies. I just want to control Europe. That's where the power is. So he says, well, if I got Louisiana, what could I do with it? Now, at the same time, Jefferson was interested in finding out about if access to the Mississippi River could be get, gotten by the United States. Why did we want access to the Mississippi River? Well, as more and more Americans move west, they're living on the Ohio River and now increasingly on the Mississippi River Valley. And they want to have access to the port of, of, of New Orleans at the tip of, uh, of Louisiana, the access point for the Mississippi River and to the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. Now, Jefferson sends over some delegates to try and talk about this, to try and get access to Louisiana and the Mississippi River. And when they send those delegates over to France, Napoleon says, well, listen, I'll do you one better. I won't just let you get access. I'll sell you the whole freaking thing, all of Louisiana. Now, Jefferson has an important decision to make. Uh, Jefferson did not really know if he could actually do this. As if you remember, and we talked about this in Unit 3, Jefferson was a strict constructionist, meaning that he really liked to see that the Constitution gave definite powers to a role like president. But when he looked at the Constitution, he knew that there was not really a power for a president to just unilaterally, by himself, solo, decide to do a treaty like this. But what did Jefferson do? He did it anyway. In 1803, he took the deal. He got all of Louisiana and the Louisiana Purchase for about $15 million from France, which sounds like a lot of money, but for all the land we would get and all the access to resources we would get, it was not a bad deal at all. It was such a good deal, that's why Jefferson thought he had to take it before Napoleon took it off the table. But there were some issues, okay, particularly Federalists in Congress, would attack Jefferson for, number one, doing something he said he wouldn't do, okay? He might be taking this power and doing stuff without congressional approval, okay? But in the end, all of those objections and complaints don't really amount to much because Jefferson does it anyway. Now, one of the most important things Jefferson would do in the wake of this is send an expedition to the West. Uh, you have probably heard about these guys, so you have Lewis and Clark, okay? Uh, Meriwether Lewis, William Clark are sent out on this expedition to go and explore as much of this Louisiana Purchase as they can. They are helped by their native guide, Sacagawea, who uh, is an interpreter, so interprets uh, with the native tribes they encounter along the way, which there are dozens and dozens of them, helps them identify uh, a lot of the flora and fauna, so flora being plants, fauna being animals that they see out there in the Great Plains that many of uh, the white settlers had never seen before, um, and helps lead them all the way up the Missouri River and then west all the way to what is today Oregon uh, at, the, at the Pacific Ocean. Uh, now, what we would find is that especially over time, this area of the United States, kind of the middle third of the country, is an extremely, extremely resource-rich area with a lot of areas for mining, a lot of areas for really, really good agriculture. And so over time, we're going to see the benefits of this purchase, even though Lewis and Clark don't find it all in that moment. 
But what's clear to them from this journey is that this was a very, very valuable purchase, and we probably made the right decision, even if it was kind of iffy on whether Jefferson could actually do it. Now, in 1804, Jefferson runs for re-election, and in this re-election, he wins overwhelmingly over the Federalist candidate Charles Pickney, easily smashes him in this 1804 election. Now, Jefferson, though, had some issues, especially in his second term as president. He came into office in his first term in 1800, 1801, wanted to reduce the size and power of the national government. But what we see is that in his first term, he had done the exact opposite with the purchase of Louisiana. He expanded government power beyond the Constitution and basically said, hey, I'm the president, I'm going to do this treaty, and you guys in Congress are going to accept it, even though that's not the way it's set up in the Constitution. So Jefferson's kind of breaking his own, you know, viewpoint there by doing what he did, even if in the long term it was probably the right decision to take that deal. But there was another big example of Jefferson breaking his own legacy. Now, in his second term, we still have an ongoing issue of the war between Britain and France, and the war between Britain and now the French Empire under Napoleon is still heating up in the 18 hundreds. Now, this is affecting us because we're trying to trade with both Britain and France, but both of these countries, but uh, especially the British, are violating our free trade, okay? So what Jefferson decides to do to finally fix this problem that, de that Washington dealt with and Adams dealt with is an embargo, okay, or a shutdown of all trade between England and France for their violations of American free trade. Now, again, this is coming because of the growth of Napoleon's empire. By 1810, Napoleon did control all that you see up there in red, directly controlled by him uh, or his immediate family. And then the further and further west, those areas that are colored in are controlled by uh, Napoleon kind of through puppet states. And really, for a large part of this decade, the only power that's standing up against uh, him forcefully is the UK. Now, this Embargo Act, which was meant to punish both France and Britain, really backfired on the Americans, though. Okay, So you see here, here's a political cartoon from the era. So you have a couple of captions here. So you have, darn it, how he nicks them. Okay? So this guy uh, is talking about this guy this turtle here, this big old snapping turtle. God, he's got this guy. And this guy, who's got some goods, he's trying to get onto a British ship, says, oh, this cursed oh, grab me. Okay? So, oh, grab me is the name of the turtle. Well, oh, grab me in reverse, E-M-B-A-R-G-O is embargo. Mm, so, clear idea of what we're talking about here, okay? The reality is, is that Americans, they will go ahead and break the law, okay? So they break the law and they trade with the British and the French anyway, even though they uh, are breaking what Jefferson wanted to do and now breaking national law, okay? So, ironically, what Jefferson had to do to enforce this embargo was to hire more federal government workers to go out and check and to make sure people aren't smuggling and whatnot. So this is ironic given that Jefferson came in wanting to shrink the size of government. But it also, long term, was more of our problem than either England or France's. Because England and France, they had other people to trade with, and they did. They just said, okay, we won't trade with the Americans. And so really who was hurt by this embargo was not either of them, but us because we lose a lot of income from trade that we could have had without this embargo. So it kind of backfires on Jefferson. Now, Jefferson will leave office in 1808, 1809, and kind of following that two-term precedent set by uh, George Washington. And the guy that he kind of handpicks to be his successor to run for president is going to be his right-hand man. James Madison. Now, James Madison will win election in both 1808 and 1812 over the 
Federalist candidates there. Um, and Madison is someone we've already talked about, okay? So he's kind of important in American history before this. He was the architect, the father of the Constitution. He had served in Congress for a while under the time of Washington Adams, and under Jefferson, served as Jefferson's Secretary of State. Um, he and Jefferson were really, really tight. Both of them were from Virginia. Both of them had similar backgrounds. And so it was an easy changeover for Jefferson to say, hey, I think you should run for office. And Madison did and won. Now, Madison, like Jefferson, was a Democratic Republican, okay? And so, just like Jefferson, he's going to try, as best as he can, to continue his policy of limited government. But it's not going to be easy for Madison, because the Embargo Act does not even get close to stopping this issue between England and France is still ongoing, and it's heating up as we get to the year 1812, okay? We see that by 1812, uh, the end of his first term in office, Madison is seeing a dual problem from both Britain, England, and France violating American free trade. However, most Americans are focusing on the British Navy, okay? Because the British Navy are impressing American merchants. To impress American merchants is essentially to kidnap them and force them to fight for you. Okay, so Americans uh, who are not in the Navy are being captured on their ships and forced to fight for the British against Napoleon. Now, this impressment causes a huge uproar, okay, and people in the United States start talking about free trade and sailors' rights, okay, that we should be able to fr trade freely and that sailors should have rights to not, I don't know, be kidnapped just because they're out in the high seas. Now, there is a little problem with this, is that it's not just the British that are doing this, the French are doing it too, but we're really, really focused on the British, okay, because a group of congressmen called the Warhawks, uh, a group of younger congressmen, folks like John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay, very, very young, who were too young to have uh, fought in the Revolutionary Era, but now are coming of age and becoming leaders in their states, are going to push for this war with Britain, saying that we must defend American honor as the British are violating it. Now, at first, Madison really tries to resist this. He tries to follow the, the examples of Washington and Adams and Jefferson by staying out of a major foreign conflict. But these Warhawks don't want to hear that. Instead, they say, we must fight. We must protect American freedom and liberty. We must fight the so-called Second American Revolution. And so... In June of 1812, James Madison will ask for, and Congress will grant, a declaration of war. And now uh, we are at war yet again with Great Britain. Now, as far as the fighting of this war, we are not going to talk a lot about battles, but we will talk about a couple of examples. But generally speaking, we could definitely say when this war began, the U.S. was not ready to fight. Okay, You may remember Jefferson, when he came to office in 1801, he reduced the size of the army. So the army was really, really small. It had not been made bigger by the time we entered this war. Not just that, but our navy was always small. We had no navy really to speak of, certainly not one that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British head-on. And so the war went pretty badly at first, okay? For example, the British and their Canadian allies will come down the coast, land uh, in Washington, D.C., and burn Washington, D.C. to the ground, okay, including the White House. The White House is burnt down, um, and so right now the White House that's in D.C. is really the second White House that was built following the War of 1812. Uh, the battle in D.C. was so bad that Madison was forced to kind of flee, and his wife, Dolly Madison, like, Famously saved a few paintings, including the famous painting of George Washington. You've almost absolutely seen that is, you know, his presidential portrait. Um, and so that's a major, major loss, okay? 
Uh, they will also lay siege to a fort in Maryland called Fort McHenry. Uh, now, Fort McHenry was kind of an important strategic point, um, and it was something that um, led to uh, an important thing that we see today. So a uh, young uh, man named Francis Scott Key was outside Fort McHenry watching the battle unfold, watching the bombs and rockets bursting in the air over the fort, okay? And as he watched it through the evening and then woke up in the morning, he saw that the fort was still standing and the flag was still up, meaning the fort had not surrendered overnight. Now, he took this, wrote these lyrics into a poem called The Star-Spangled Banner, which would later be set to the uh, to an English drinking song, the tune of an English drinking song, to be made into what would become our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Yes, the Star Spangled Banner is uh, is set to the tune of an English drinking song. So that's pretty cool. Now, that is one big outcome of the War of 1812, this kind of patriotism that grows out of the Star Spangled Banner. But there is a good question. So we kind of lost there? So why are we patriotic? Mm, it's a good question, Okay. Well, the reality is, is that while the British are fighting us and they're winning, they're not really fighting us with a lot of heart. They don't care because at that particular moment, they are very, very strongly fighting Napoleon and trying to finish him off once and for all. So the British don't really have any incentive to keep the fighting going on any longer than it has to. They want peace. And eventually a lot of Americans want peace, too, because this isn't going so hot for us. Now, in 1814, we will have sent uh, delegates over to Britain to meet the British in the town of Ghent, Belgium, to begin to negotiate a treaty to end the war. However, there is one major battle yet to occur. Now, this one happened down in the south, down near the battle, uh, down near New Orleans, in this newly acquired area of Louisiana. Now, the problem is, is that in this time, news does not travel fast, okay? It actually has to get on a boat and go across the ocean to get to the Americas. And so this battle, the Battle of New Orleans, is going on at the same time this treaty is being signed, okay? Now, the Americans at New Orleans are led by this guy, Andrew Jackson, who I've already mentioned his name in this video, and he will be the person we end Unit 4 with his presidency. Now, at the Battle of New Orleans, Jackson is able to set up defenses that lead to a massive amount of British casualties with virtually no American deaths. And this massive routing of the British troops is huge news across the United States, okay? But there's just one problem. As news of the treaty comes across the Atlantic, this news is spreading from Louisiana up towards the rest of the South and the North at about the same time. So Americans hear this news kind of simultaneously. They hear it at the same time. So they hear, hey, we won this big battle, the Battle of New Orleans against the British. Woo! And hey, we have a treaty with the British to end the war. Woo! And most Americans think, oh, hey, this battle at New Orleans won us the war. No, it didn't. Because the treaty had already been signed at that point. It was already on a boat headed over to the United States. We just didn't know it yet, okay? But that doesn't quite matter because Americans feel like they won, and that's worth it. Now, the thing is, and the way you know we really didn't win is because when you actually look at this Treaty of Ghent, it doesn't actually deal with, with anything that we talked about. It didn't deal with trade rights and the impressment of sailors. It did not deal with uh, the threat of Canada and the fact that the Canadians burned Washington, D.C. It didn't deal with any of that, okay? But it still had a lot of effects. Uh, it did unite the Americans, okay, bringing them together in a sense of nationalism because they do feel like they won, and sometimes feels are better than reals in this case. And for the first time, we enter this era of good feelings with a popular president, Madison, followed by the next guy, James Madison, 
in a booming national economy. And for a while, we do not have a, uh, uh, a two-party system. Instead, we are really, really kind of united as one national government. But we didn't really win the war. So we'll leave it there. Tomorrow we will start talking about the successor to Madison, James Monroe, and this era of good feelings. A little bit about why it might not be such an era of good feelings, though, because problems are brewing. But we'll get to that tomorrow. See you then.